Quick warning, this episode does cover some very disturbing and violent material, so viewer and listener discretion is advised. Anything you say can and will be used in a podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Right, are we good? Yeah, I think so. I realise now that bringing cookies to a podcast is probably not a good idea. (laughs) Hello and welcome to Weird Wessex. My name's Andy. And my name's Craig. And today we're going to be telling you about the Hungerford Massacre and the murderer Christopher Halliwell. Starting with the Hungerford Massacre, on the 19th of August 1987... 27-year-old Michael Ryan drove into Savanac Forest from his hometown in Hungerford, which was about seven miles away. A little side note here is that a guy called Robert Snook was from Hungerford, um, probably deserves an episode of his own. He was the last highwayman uh, to be executed in England. And um, Yeah, Robert Snook's a fantastic name for a highwayman as well, I think. But... Uh... Yes, Michael, he'd spent a lot of time at Savanac Forest. Um, one, it was one of his favourite places. Uh, apparently, he would track wildlife through it, uh, practising his survival skills. One of his former schoolmates remembered him boasting how he would actually stalk people through the forest and make a little game of how close he could get to them and how long he could stalk them for um, without them noticing, which some experts who look into the case later on have thought may be some kind of sexual thing. I actually think that Michael's a bit of a bullshitter, but I think we'll come to that. Yeah, he was he was a bit of a loner as well. Um, his father had died a few years before from cancer and he lived alone with his mother. Um, he'd been bullied at school. He didn't really have any friends. He didn't have a job to speak of. Um, and most people that knew him described him as fairly harmless, a bit weird. Um, he made things up quite a lot. Um, other claims that he made were things like uh, serving in the parachute regiment, which he never did. Um, he claimed that he was getting married. He wasn't, didn't have a girlfriend, to my knowledge, let alone a fiance, and that he owned a gun shop. Um, he didn't own a gun shop, but he did own a fair few guns. He was a member of several shooting clubs, and those guns included a Beretta pistol, an M1 carbine rifle, and a Type 56 semi automatic rifle. I find that quite weird to be honest like before the gun reform that follows what we're about to say like the public seemed to be more armed than the police force yes i mean obviously that changed partially due to the events that we're about to describe but um yeah it was at a point i remember my granddad i think owned owned a gun and he he got rid of it um again quite tied into this story but um yeah, a lot of people used to have guns, you know, whereas, you know, you go somewhere and they might have an air gun now or an air pistol. You know, back then that was pistols, that was rifles, like single shot rifles quite often. Shotguns are a lot easier to come by. And yeah, absolutely. You you had a police force that was nowhere near as armed as they are nowadays. They had one armed response unit and I think they were on a training exercise several hours drive away at this point. Yeah. So like yeah, each- not a good start. Yeah, each county would have its own little dedicated team, but that was about it, you know. On this particular morning in 1987, a 35-year-old lady named Susan Godfrey and her two children, who were two and four years old, had stopped for a picnic in the forest. Susan was on her way to a birthday party at one of her grandparents, and her father had recommended she stop at Savanac for a picnic along the way. Um, So, openly armed, Michael Ryan approaches the family um, and he makes her put the children back into the car before taking Susan off into the woods. He lays a ground sheet on the floor and he shoots her in the back with a pistol 13 times. It was speculated it might have been because he tried to have sex with her and maybe she rejected him. Um, but I don't think there's any actual evidence for that. That's just a speculation. Um, so yeah, he covers her with a ground sheet and then he leaves. The kids were later found wandering in the woods by a lady um, and they said to her that a man in black had killed their mum. Yeah, that's the dark bit. Well, yeah, I was going to say, I think there's a bit more darkness to come, really. Yeah. Um, At that point, he left the forest and drove to a petrol station in a place called Froxfield. Uh, He filled his car up with petrol. He filled a canister up with petrol, which was unusual for him, but we'll go into that later. 
Uh, after that, he then shot at the cashier um, in the in the kiosk in the petrol station with his M1 carbine, which is like a single shot bolt action rifle. Um, he missed. He goes into the store and tried to shoot her at point blank range, but the gun jammed. No idea why, but he just leaves at that point. So at this point, Michael returns home. Uh, this is a home that he shared with his mother in Hungerford. One of the neighbours, Marjorie Jackson, saw him enter the house and thought he looked very upset about something. Um, when he goes in, he shoots the family dog. Um, he then exits the house with a bunch of equipment with him. Uh, he's got ammunition, he's got survival gear, even a flak jacket. He tries to start his car, but it doesn't start, it fails. Not sure why. Um, so, after a moment, he goes inside the house with the petrol canister that he filled up, pours it over his living room and sets fire to it. So, leaving the house, he heads towards the local school playing fields and en route he shot and killed two of his neighbours, a Roland and Sheila Mason. Um, at this point, there was a 14-year-old girl who also lived nearby and she heard the noise, wondered what's going on, so she goes to have a look. Um, Michael shot her four times in the leg. Luckily, her mother and another nearby resident were able to give her first aid, and so she survives. Michael then shot Marjorie Jackson in the back, wounding her. Marjorie, if you remember, was the one who had seen Michael arrive home from Savannah. So, past the playing field, he walks along a footpath back um, towards the town's common. Um, he shot and killed a 51-year-old guy named Kenneth Clements there with his semi-automatic rifle. Clements had been walking his dog uh, with his family. His family did manage to escape uninjured, though. He then returns to the street that he lives on uh, from the common, and the first police officers begin to arrive. And they aim to sort of close both ends of that road off to contain reports of a possible gunman. These officers were unarmed, though. And when Michael saw the police, he shoots one of the police officers, PC Roger Berriton, in the chest with his pistol. Berriton, who was in his patrol car at the time, crashed into a telegraph pole. Michael walked up to the crashed car and shot him through the window with his semi-automatic while the police officer was trying to radio in support for an active gunman. Still on the same road, Michael then shoots at a mother and a daughter who had just turned onto the lane with their car. Uh, both were struck, although the mother was able to reverse the car out of the road and get away. Um, he then next fired at a two-person crew of an ambulance who were responding to 999 calls on the road. Uh, both managed to escape without injury, though. After this, two of Berriton's colleagues came upon uh, Kenneth Clement's son, so that chap who'd been shot um, on the playing fields, who informed them that a shooter had continued along the road. So the officers then headed to investigate, and Michael shot at them as well. One took shelter in a house and the other one, with Clement's son, drove across the common to safety. Yeah, so uh, next Michael shot at a man called George White, who was returning from a trip to Newbury with his friend Ivor Jackson. George was driving his car when Michael shot him with the semi-automatic and he was killed instantly. Ivor sustained severe injuries and feigned death, but actually survived. Um, Michael then walked to the junction of his street and an adjoining road where he found an 84-year-old named Abda Khan who was tending to his garden um, and he shot and killed him instantly. So after firing at and injuring a pedestrian, Michael then headed back towards the common. One of the police officers in attendance makes another 999 call, but by this point the telephone network had reached its capacity. The local station at this point was actually undergoing renovations and unfortunately only had two working phone lines available. Yeah. Um, so it's at this point in the story where Michael's mother, Dorothy, arrives. She'd been out shopping and running errands um, and she was returning home in her car when she saw a fully armed Michael. She shouted at him to stop before he shot her four times, twice at point blank range. So as Michael is heading onward, a resident in a parallel street uh, comes out and shouted to him in what I think is quite an iconic phrase given the circumstances. Uh, she shouts, kindly stop that racket. Um, he then proceeds to shoot her in the groin. Uh, thankfully, she survived. Uh, PC Wood um, was then joined by two armed police officers at the command post that they'd set up on the common. Two minutes later, they see Michael at the War Memorial Recreation Grounds on the edge of that area. Near those grounds, he shoots uh, 26-year-old Francis Butler with the semi-automatic as he walked his dog. Uh, a witness gave 
Butler first aid, but unfortunately he died before an ambulance could arrive. At this point, Michael discards his carbine, the single shot uh, rifle. Um, it hadn't worked since he'd used it to shoot at someone at that petrol station earlier in the day. Um, he also temporarily got rid of his semi-automatic. It may have run out of ammunition, it may have jammed, we don't know. Um, he recovered it later though. Uh, the subsequent killings were all done though with his pistol. Um, he next shoots at but missed a teenager on a bicycle. He then reached another road called Bullpit Lane. He kills a taxi driver there named Marcus Bernard, who was in his cab at the time. So Michael next heads down Prairie Avenue, where he shot and injured the occupant of a parked van. And by this time, police had set up road diversions um, and some of Michael's victims were actually drivers affected by the changes to route. Um, this included a Douglas and Kathleen Wainwright who had come to visit their son, but due to the diversions were forced to approach the area where Michael happened to be. They were only 90 meters from their destination when Michael shot Douglas dead and injured Kathleen uh, before non-fatally shooting at two other drivers. Um, just a side note there before we go on, there is a bit of a tragic connection um, between Michael Ryan and Douglas and Kathleen, isn't there? There is, yes. Um, their son was a man named Trevor Wainwright, an off-duty police officer who also happened to be the man that issued or approved Michael's firearms license. Michael next shot at a van, killing the occupant, uh, who was an Eric Vardy. By 1.30, Michael headed along a street called Orchard Park, close, shooting at houses as he passed them. He then shot at a passing car and fatally injured the driver, a 22-year-old Sandra Hill. After shooting Sandra, Michael forced his way into a house further down the road and shot the occupants, a 66-year-old Jack Gibbs and his 62-year-old wife Myrtle. Jack was killed instantly and Myrtle died two days later at the Princess Margaret Hospital in Swindon. Uh, yeah, so Princess Margaret is actually somewhere that I know fairly well. Um, I was actually born there. I don't know if you knew that. Really? I, I haven't seen your birth certificate in a while. No. Well. <laughs> I, I lost I lost my copy of it. Um, I'll get you another one. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, so, I mean, this, this story is a bit more, I guess, closer to home for you, isn't it? <clears throat> I mean, you were, what, like four when this happened? Uh, yeah, yeah, I would have been, no, hang on, 87, yeah. I'd have been coming up for four years old, August 87. Um, and then, yeah. Obviously, lots of family history, trips to A&E, cracking your head open. I spent a lot of time at Princess Margaret Hospital. Uh, it's actually where my mum passed away as well. Which oh, is, is it? Uh, but it's it's no longer there. They've replaced it with a newer hospital. Um, and actually, it's now a housing estate, which is kind of strange. Yeah, it's it's a funny one, isn't it? Because you you got um. A lot of people are weary about being, uh, you know, sort of having houses that in places that used to be graveyards or too close to graveyards. But realistically, if anywhere is going to be haunted, it's going to be the site of a hospital. Yeah, yeah. A lot goes on there. Um... Still in the Gibbs house, Michael starts shooting at neighbouring houses. Now, you've got to remember there's sirens going off, there's gunshots, people are looking out their windows and several people are injured as he's shooting at them uh, from the window of the house he's in. He then leaves the home. Um, he continues south on Priory Road, where he shoots uh, at a car driven by a 34-year-old Ian Playle, who was fatally struck in the neck. His wife and their two children managed to escape injury, but Playle died in Radcliffe Infirmary in Oxford two days later. At this point, a police helicopter has arrived on the scene. It's actually broadcasting um, from a loud hailer for people to stay in their homes and warnings about what's going on. Uh, he then goes on to shoot and injure a male outside a property on Priory Road. Um, and then he's seen once more down the bottom of that road approaching John O'Gorn's school, which was luckily closed for the summer holidays. A school caretaker reports seeing a man enter one of the school buildings and the tactical firearms unit secure the gardens and houses surrounding it. And this happens at approximately 4pm. Yeah, so by... 4.40, they hear gunshots in the vicinity of the school and more officers arrive at the scene. Um, at least one further shot from a school building was heard at 5.15. 
um, and it's thought these might have been aimed at the police and press helicopters. Michael's precise location after the shooting at 1.45 had been unknown um, as there were no confirmed sightings, but by 5.26 police saw him at the school um, shortly after he threw his second semi-automatic out of a third floor window. So once containment of Ryan was confirmed, fire and ambulance crews were able to get into the lockdown parts of the town, including uh, the fire at Southview at his house, um, which had spread and destroyed the home as well as three other properties on the same terrace. So he starts firing at both police uh, and the helicopters that were circling above, which may have been news ones. Um, he became then engaged in conversation with a sergeant within the TFU, uh, the Tactical Firearms Unit, and informed them of the weapons he had and ammunition. He also claimed to have a grenade alongside the pistol. So Michael says he won't exit the building until the police inform him of the welfare of his mother. And he states, and I quote, Hungerford must be a bit of a mess. The sergeant said he understood Michael when he claimed that his mother's death was a mistake. And Michael replied, how can you understand? I wish I'd stayed in bed. He later shouted, it's funny, I killed all those people, but I haven't the guts to blow my own brains out. By 6.52, after a few minutes of silence, a shot was heard from the building and Michael no longer responded to police. So without knowing the full extent of Michael's arsenal and ammunition, and with the possibility of booby traps or more perpetrators, the police stayed at their positions and devised an operation to enter the building. So at eight o'clock, their plan was enacted. Um, I believe someone actually climbed onto the roof and used a mirror to sort of see inside um, where they saw Michael's body. And at around 10 past eight, police entered a barricaded room where he'd sort of pushed tables and chairs up against the door and they found Michael Ryan dead of a self-inflicted gunshot wound through the right temple. Um, for anyone keeping count, he fired 133 shots in just a little over six hours, I believe. Um, he killed 16 and injured 15, uh, which was the worst mass shooting in British history. Is uh, that, I think, isn't that the same number as Dunblane? until Dunblane in 1996 where one more person was killed um oh, it's one more shooter. yeah one more in Dunblane but both cases 15 people were injured as well um yeah it's... yeah I did read about Dunblane the other day um I'll be honest no amount of blue he's going to make up for that one that's uh as dark as this story is Dunblane is oh just tragic bunch of yeah. five and six year olds it's horrible it really is i remember i i was i was 10 when that happened and i remember we had a school assembly about it but yeah no dunblane is mm. yeah it, it was you know a, a horrific event and between um those two shootings uh is why we have the gun lords we have today i mean um you've got after hungerford I believe semi-automatic rifles were banned as well as shotguns that held more than three cartridges in the chamber. Michael Ryan didn't use a shotgun in the spree, but he did have shotguns and they said, you know, someone could do something similar with those. So those were banned. There was an amnesty. Thousands and thousands of guns were given in. And then when Dunblane happened, handguns went out as well. And apart from a few incidences, um, incidences, <laughs> incidents, and apart from a few incidents um, uh, down in Plymouth up north, um, there haven't really been any mass shootings, especially on that scale since. Um, I think the the amnesty, I think the total was 48,000 firearms were handed in, which is which, crazy. Yeah, it is. It is. And again, goes back to that point that you've got a populace that's kind of more armed than the police force, you know? Yeah. Um, and I know, I know, sort of in places like America, where it's in their constitution, like that sort of thing horrifies them handing in their guns. You know, they always say, well, what would you do against a corrupt government if they turn on you? And it's like, well, they've got tanks and drones, mate. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. but it's, yeah, it, it, it's bizarre thinking of, you know, sort of that many guns in the populace. Yeah. So no clear motive was ever found. But um, psychologist Craig Jackson of Birmingham City University suggests that Michael may have been sexually motivated in the initial attack on Susan Godfrey in Savanek. Um, But other than that, he never left any anything to say why he did it. This did leave me wondering. Now, I, I happen to know a police officer that was loosely involved. I used, I did a bit of work with him down in Marlborough on a, he was also a, 
um, a gamekeeper as well after he was in the police and yeah sort of did a few bits and pieces but he was he was sort of around when the Hungerford massacre happened um, he so was, he was your parole officer basically yeah <laughs> um yeah he he knew officers involved as well and he yeah he he was the one that told me initially that he thinks it may have been a sexual assault gone wrong um that then yeah. tipped michael ryan over the edge now something that no one will ever know he's talked about it and you know reading this has kind of made me think about it as well is what would he have done if he could have started his car you know because yeah that i'm sure um filling up a can of petrol as well if he went into the house then came out then start tried to start his car then take the can of petrol back in he wasn't intending to burn his house down until no. that happened i make i think there is a quote as well but i i'm paraphrasing but i'm sure he does say to the officers before he shoots himself that if only my car had started none of this would have happened or something like that i mean I get if you're going to go on a mass shooting, you know, and you see these horrible instances in the States and elsewhere where people do go out and they've got tactical assault gear on, they've got flak jackets, that all checks out. But the fact he took survival gear with him as well and threw that in the car, that kind of inclined, that, that to me makes me think he was going to try and go on the run, you know? Yeah. Though that doesn't really explain why he shot and tried to kill the lady in the petrol station. No witnesses? Yeah, I guess. I guess. I don't know. Tying him to... Although he had other weapons, so if he really wanted to do it, he could have. Yeah, maybe it was an impulse. I don't know, but it does make me think he was going to try and go on the run rather than just go on a killing spree at first. I know um, he was said as well that he only ever partly filled his car up like with a couple of quid of petrol at a time. So the fact that he filled his car up completely and a separate tank made them suspicious before he even started shooting at them. Yeah, yeah, the fact that, because obviously it's a small small town, people know each other, and that's a regular petrol station he goes to in between there and Hungerford and Savanac, so, yeah. yeah. He never it, filled his car up before this day. So yeah. he was planning to go somewhere. Absolutely, absolutely. And, I, yeah, I, I, I'm inclined to think he was maybe, I don't know, maybe he was going to try and continue a killing spree of sorts elsewhere, but... Yeah, I, I'm inclined to believe that he was going to try and get as far away from Hungerford and Savanac as possible. There's, yeah, I don't know. It's weird. Like, you can speculate. Yeah, we could we'll do never this all day. Know. But yeah, we'll never it's know. like you could go, well, okay, his car didn't start, but he could have stolen another car or he could have taken the keys from one of the houses that he broke into and taken yeah. the car. Like, he had plenty of opportunities to disappear, but yeah. it's almost sounds like downplaying it a bit but it spirals out of control for him yeah i mean between between like trying to kill the lady in the petrol station shooting his dog you know it, it seems like he was yeah at that breaking point but again i'm not a uh you know psychologist i i, I don't know i you know wasn't there but you know that, that's what i personally believe but yeah we'll never know as you say yeah so the next story is a little bit more recent, actually, isn't it? Um, this is a story about a guy called Christopher Hallowell, who was from my hometown of Swindon, very close to home. So the story starts with 22-year-old woman, Shano Callahan, who disappears from Swindon on March 19th, 2011. At 2.52am, Shan was captured on CCTV, leaving Swindon Suju nightclub to walk 800 metres to the flat that she shared with her boyfriend, who was called Kevin Reap. Kevin sent Sean a message at around 3.24 and analysis later showed that her mobile phone was somewhere in the Savanac Forest area, which is 12 miles away. So at uh, 9.45 a.m. when he doesn't hear anything back, Kevin reports to police that Sean is missing. So the CCTV footage showed a car, but due to the headlights and the glare from those, the details of the vehicle were unclear at the time. Uh, Sean is seen walking past the car though, and then as she goes off screen, the car um, then drives off. Um, police managed to eventually find the car through other um, surveillance, and they had officers following it, and its owner was a 47-year-old taxi driver, and former burglar, gave it up for taxi driving I guess, 
um, named Christopher Halliwell. He's seen um, at one point uh, by these surveillance officers scrubbing his car seat. Uh, the police follows him, he goes out and watches he drives around town and as he's driving he's getting rid of uh, seat covers and a headrest which he dumps in an industrial bin. Officers then saw him burning items in the road on March the 23rd which were later identified from the remains to be two front seat bases, two back, uh, seat backs and two headrests and the base to the rear seat as well. So on uh, March 24th Christopher was arrested um, he'd been seen buying what the police classed as an overdose quantity of pills from a chemist. So presumably they thought he was about to take his own life. After his arrest, he initially denies having anything to do with Sean's death. But later he leads police to her body. He was found down a steep bank around 15 foot from the verge of a road in a remote countryside in Uffington. Sean had been killed by a head injury. So then Halliwell leads the police to another body. Um, although he claimed not to know who she was. This victim was Becky Godden Edwards, who was a 20-year-old that had gone missing back in 2007. However, Police Detective Superintendent Stephen Fulcher had breached the guidelines, apparently, of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act of 1984 by failing to caution Halliwell and denying him access to a solicitor during the period that the confessions were taken. Despite the support of the O'Callaghan family as well as Becky's family, Fulcher was demoted and suspended and found guilty of gross misconduct and eventually uh, resigned from the force. So one really sad detail that I found was Becky's mum had spent eight years not knowing whether she was going to come home or not. She disappeared. She was known to be a drug addict. Um, I think she was a sex worker as well. Um, and her mum hadn't heard from her, but she'd spent those eight years wrapping up presents for her birthday and leaving them in the cupboard in Becky's bedroom in case she ever came back. Um, and unfortunately, I believe the day that the police knocked on the door to say they'd found Becky's body was actually Becky's birthday. Oh no, that is, that's, that's rough. Yeah. Um, in 2012, Chris Halliwell was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum tariff of 25 years for the murder of Sean, but Becky's murder was initially dropped off of the charges as his involvement was seen as circumstantial only, which I don't really understand considering he led them to her body. That was very Took her straight point. there. I what think he even to... paced out from like a fence and he took paces and went, there's a body here. Like, how's that circumstantial? It's, it's one of those things, I guess, that it's, you know, it's to do with that red tape and that sort of, you know, yeah. uh, technicality, yeah. I guess. But... Later persistence from Becky's mother led to the police to gather more evidence, including witnesses that saw her get into Halliwell's car and him being in the area her body was found on the same night. Um, apparently Chris called for roadside assistance, having run out of petrol, and he visited his doctor the next day to treat a broken finger and having scratch marks on his face, um, which, you know, obviously evidence is that Becky fought back uh, quite viciously. On the 23rd of September 2016, Chris was sentenced to life imprisonment with a whole life order for the murder of Becky. A whole life order means that he would serve his sentence without any possibility at all of parole. Now that's quite a rare occurrence in the UK. I think at that point, only 50 odd other prisoners had had that happen. So it wasn't something that happened often. And that potentially is an incredibly lucky thing because as it turns out beyond these two murders, Chris Halliwell may potentially be one of Britain's worst serial killers. In 2014, police found Sean's boots buried amongst 60 other items of women's clothing, one of which was a cardigan belonging to Becky. The rest of the clothing is thought to potentially belong to other unidentified victims of Halliwell. Christopher was a regular user of sex workers and some reported being picked up by Halliwell in the weeks before Sean's death. Um, and a quote said he got rough and weird. Um, and some got frightened and called for help. An ex-cellmate of Chris's in the 80s also reported afterwards that the Halliwell had once asked him how many people he'd have to kill to be classed as a serial killer. Um, so, partly circumstantial, but Sean went missing on March 19th. Um, and actually, it's the same date that Chris was dumped while serving a prison sentence in the 80s. Now... There are some other cases where these dates line up as well. So while that seems like a small detail, I think it's quite an important one. 
So on the same date in 2002, a woman Chris had been having an affair with named Linda Rizal went missing. And Linda was actually in the process of getting a divorce from her husband, Glenn, um, and he was actually charged for the murder and is still serving the sentence today, despite always pleading his innocence. Um, it's actually a case that comes up. I noticed an article from just last year where he'd appealed again. And the reason that they won't let him out is because he won't tell them where the body is. But now, obviously, if he didn't do it, he can't tell them where the body is. Yeah. So... It depends whether you believe him or not, but it does seem rather suspect that Chris also had an affair with the same lady. So actually, I believe that one was um, on a street called Broad Street. And looking at the date, it's possible I lived on the same street as Chris at one point. Oof. Yeah, 2002, I was living for a few months. I lived in a shared house on Broad Street. On March the 19th, again, this time in 2009, um, in York, which is where Chris's father lived and Chris would often visit him, Claudia Lawrence disappeared and Chris is said to perfectly match witness descriptions of the man um, seen close by to her. Sally Ann John, a sex worker in Swindon, disappears in 1995 um, after reports that Chris had become obsessed with her. However, three men were arrested but later released in connection in 2015 to that case, uh, which I believe is still unresolved. Yeah, I couldn't find any follow-up. Once they're released, they weren't re-arrested again, so I don't know what happened there. I think that, that date comes back to, you know, it does seem more than coincidence at that point, given the connections of Chris and women going missing on that date. So, yeah, a lot of these connections are actually made by um, Stephen Fulcher. So um, I know he's written books on the case, and he's still very much sort of involved with looking into it. Yeah, I mean, he, yeah, and you, you can see why he would be involved in that case still, you know, considering the path his life took afterwards as well and his connection to it and probably the feelings of guilt associated to it as well. Chris is where he belongs now. Um, he's in his early 60s, I believe. He hasn't admitted to uh, any other killings, um, anything like that. But, uh, yeah, it, it does seem to be likely to me at least that he you know given what they found when they found becky's boots uh, sorry becky's cardigan and sean's boots it does seem to me like there is there is definitely some more there you know i mean whether it was a, a trophy thing or just a place that he went and disposed of these things i don't know so that's about it from us this time round. um we're yeah we're not doing weird news as we decided this might be a little bit too dark a topic for that. And you already got some with the Savanac part one. Um, but while true crime isn't really our thing as much as folklore and superstition and the paranormal, if you enjoyed this, let us know. We can potentially do some more in the future. But I think we're going to try and do something a little bit lighter next time. What do you think? Well... I've already been making notes on the exorcism of Michael Taylor, so oh. I think we're going to do that next. Great. Uh, yeah. Uh, Some light relief. <laughs> yeah. Um, not not quite what I was thinking of, but, you know, we'll do it. It's more paranormal than this one. This this is true. It does at least have a connection to the paranormal and less people die. Uh, that's all yes. I'll say on that. But uh, we'll, we'll do something like fairies soon, I reckon. I think we need to do fairies. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And um, if you did like it, give us a like on our social medias, um, Facebook, YouTube. Five star rating. <laughs> I don't yeah. like up 10 fingers for a five star rating. Do it twice. So, yeah, until next time, stay weird. And me.